Hi folks. Sorry Cassie's bed's not made. She she has new chores now that she's 13. She has to do her own laundry. I mean, uh, she's never had to do hard work. I give her chores to do, but she needs to learn how to take care of her stuff. So Before she went to school, she stripped her bed and she'll do her laundry when she gets home. You know, um, teaching our children to be accountable and responsible is not a very hard thing to do when we ask God to help us. You know, it avoids the confrontations and the screaming and the yelling and the fussing and the fighting. And and I always tell her, you know, when you read the word, God's message says it one time. He don't, he don't, you know, go three times and you're out, you know. But that's not what this message today is about. I want to give you an example of my method of what I did throughout my boot camp, what I call boot camp for the Lord. I am through the 17 years, 18, 20 years now, more and more. And how it um, helps you in so many ways, so many ways. Number one, it, it, it teaches you to discipline yourself to go to the Word. Read the Word. The Word is God and God is the Word. That's book the, the book of John, John chapter 1, verse 1. It teaches you self-discipline. It teaches you to prioritize your uh, daily duties. I, I just, for my, for my uh, discipline, uh, I had come across scripture in the Psalms that the Lord loves to come meet you early in the morn. And so... Uh, I'm an early riser, and years ago, and I've never gotten up with an alarm clock. Years ago, I, I would get up five o'clock, like alarm clock went off. But I uh, set an alarm for four o'clock, and on purpose made myself get up and give the Lord one hour in the dark, first thing every day, every morning. And it was shocking to me that. The very first day that I got up, I, could, I couldn't focus. I couldn't keep my attention span on him for five minutes. It, within five minutes, I had the lights on. I was at the, th at the sink doing the dishes or wiping the counters down or just putting a load, load of laundry in. And I'm thinking, wait a minute, Gladys. You didn't get up an hour early for this. You need to go back and sit down and get the Bible and, and read or, and, or just focus. Try to get your mind set and think about, you know, fix my eyes on Jesus. And so, um, throughout my time, I had uh, my mother at the time when she was alive, she always bought those Esquire papers, you know, those papers that tell tall stories about the celebrities and whatnot. I always call them smut papers, and, but she loved them. She, she bought every one of them and read them all. And it just really, she really liked them. And so, um... Gosh, I lost my train of thought. Well, anyway, I would get up early in the morning and try to focus and keep my eyes fixed on the Lord. And so I would um, pick up the Bible and read. First pray. I would always pray. I would always uh, give thanks, worship, and be grateful. Let the Lord know how grateful I was. And give him thanks that he gave me life this day because uh, I was also in the process of incorporating learning how to live one day at a time. Because as I read through the word, this is how you apply the word to your life. The word says yesterday is gone, today is today, and tomorrow's not here yet. So don't even consider it. Leave it alone. Think about today. Today is today. And it says, work out your salvation day by day. So I would, you know, th this is what is so important about reading the Word. I would take these scriptures that would just kind of, a little, something would click up there and in my heart. And I would, I would apply them, try to apply them on a day by day basis and put them into practice. And though that method is what helped me 
to produce my methodology, if you want to call it that, my um, training myself up, as the Apostle Paul says, we are to not be babies in the Lord. We are to not drink milk like babies. We are to uh, read the Word as an athlete trains for a marathon. You know, if you want to do a 20-mile marathon, you're not going to just never run, and then the 20-mile marathon day comes up, get up and start running. You'll, you'll never make the first mile. you got to train yourself every day. Get out there and run till you make that 20 miles. And you, and when you do, you're, you're doing it, you know, on your feet, not on your face. And so the word, the prince, it's a principle. You train yourself up. So using the word helps you to overcome who you used to be prior to the word, prior to your belief prior to your faith in God, prior to your reconciling yourself unto the Lord, the Creator, and, um, and letting God help you in your day-by-day -day troubles, trials, and tribulations, worries, and woes, afflictions, and diseases, depressions, and whatever. And it helps redirect your stinking thinking. I call it stinking thinking when I used to think like what I'll use the word negative, negative thoughts. Oh, I'm, you know, I'm not worth the time of day or, you know, that person doesn't like me and I don't blame them and that kind of stuff. You know, you'd be surprised what goes through your head because our minds are like the wilderness. And I learned this through Joyce Myers and she's my mentor. And I used a lot of her teaching material to help me to learn how to discipline myself as she did and, and because I wanted to be like she was with the Lord. I didn't want to be Joyce Myers. I'm not Joyce Myers. I'm Gladys. I am who I am. I'm very similar to her. We have a lot of things in common. You know, we come from abuse. We've been abused. And then we rejected the Lord. And then we found the Lord. And then we went through these years of, of training. You know, and um, we become these new creatures. This new person. This renewed mind. Refreshed body. Restored soul. You know, where our sinful nature is harbored. And um, studying the Word of God is so very important. It is the most important thing that we as Christians, God-fearing people, uh, the body of Christ, the true believers in uh, Abba Father, one God, uh, can do for themselves. You can't be born again and get saved and just think you can go on with your life as you're doing it and cussing and ranting and raving and drinking and whoring and and beating your kids and you know talking down to your husbands and wives and mistreating one another and uh, laying around being lazy and unproductive and ineffective in your life and expect to go to heaven you know true I would question one's salvation if they said that they were born again and they lived their life like that because to be truly born again, you're going to hunger for God. You're going to want to read the Word because you're going to need and want that change. You're fed up. You want that change. And so reading the Word is God. It, it tells you who He is, how He thinks, what He expects, and it, it's our navigator through life because life is about, it's not about living, it's about learning. That's what I always told my son, who now sits in prison for the second time. But he thought life was about living. He wanted to live life to the fullest and to the edge all the way and took whatever was thrown at him and didn't care about the consequences and it's destroyed his life it, it it's destroyed his wife his daughter his his home his his credit his job cre he could never he'll never get a job 
and he'll never have a, a credit line, which our credit isn't going to be, it'll be worthless the way the government's going anyway, so I don't know that that's all that important. But the point is, he chose to live his life very recklessly. And due to that fact, he lost everything. He lost everything. I have to say I'm a very bold woman. I have only one child. And I didn't raise him that way. We didn't drink. We didn't. The only thing that I know that we did that I will confess is I was a ranter and a raver and a screamer and a cusser. I had one foul mouth. I could ream you up and down and you wouldn't even know it. And you'd think, oh, you know. And I didn't care. I was not a nice person 30 years ago. Not a nice person at all. And it takes time to let the Word of God change you. The, the, the change comes from putting the Word into practice on a day-by-day -day basis, working out your salvation day-by-day, by, day, by obeying it through your faith. You believe by faith that Jesus Christ came, died, was resurrected and now sits at the right hand of God and still yet today serves mankind. He came as a servant. He's a king of kings and lord of lords, sits at the right hand of the throne of the Heavenly Father, but yet he still serves the creation, we the creation. And if you want eternal life for your soul, ye must be born again and you can only be born again and see the Father through the Son. That's what being born again is. It's not, a lot of people don't, well how can I be born again? It's a spiritual birth. When the fleshly, when my fleshly body dies and I get cremated, that's my choice, my body is gone. Ashes to ashes. But my spirit, my soul, will live on because I'm born again. I've accepted Jesus as my Lord and Savior. I believe he died on the cross for me. I believe my sins were on his back when he died on that cross. And I believe when I repent, my sins are forgiven and he loves me. And when I die, my soul, the angels will come and collect me and take me to the throne of God. And I will sup with the Lord that day. Okay, and I will meet all those from earth that made it to heaven but I won't remember anybody left behind it says in the word you won't there are no tears no sorrow no pain no disease no none of that stuff in heaven and you won't have no memory of your family because if you did you'd be weeping once you got up there because it'd be so different than the world you'd be and, and the Bible says there is no tears so and it says there is no marriage in heaven so you may see your husband up there, but you won't recognize him as your physical, er, worldly, earthly husband, but you'll recognize him as the, a, a child of God, such as yourself, in heaven. And you will fellowship and be friends and love one another as God loves you. God's love is different than the world's love. I learned if I ever fall in love again, I'm 62 years old now. It will have to be on the basis of the love of God, the way God loves mankind, because that is unconditional love. 1 Corinthians 13, 4 tells you what love is. Okay, here's a good lesson. So you go to 1 Corinthians, and I put these little markers in my Bible, these little tabs right here. You can buy them in the Bible Christian bookstores. And it helps you get quick to your scripture that you want. And uh, you're not standing there for, you know, 10 minutes looking for a book in the Bible somewhere, someplace, you know. And you're quick to get to the scripture that you want. So in 1 Corinthians t um, 13 verse 4, this is God's love. This is why he can forgive you of your sins. And this is why he, he died for you. And this is why today, no matter who you are, what you've done, how old you are, 
you can come to him accept him as your Lord and Savior repent and acknowledge that you're a sinner and repent of your sins and be born again and when you die your soul will live in heaven if you don't you can believe this or not if you don't believe me uh, I pray for those people in the world and there will be people who will die never knowing God and refusing to accept God I can't imagine today why because I can't go on without my God I used to be an atheist to be honest with you prior to me shaking my fist and being angry because I was fed up with life everything was just negative everything was down everything was you know we were poor as church mice you know my son was rebellious for, uh, uh, from the day he was born you know he cried every two hours and you know he was he was a good kid till the sixth grade and then that bully started fighting with him and once he learned how to fight that was the end of it I just I lost my kid then and didn't even know it didn't realize it but it wasn't until he sh shot that methamphetamines up his nose and went to his brain that's when I lost my son and um, that was uh, 18 years ago and uh, he loved drugs you know and my 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 granddaughter of whom I've adopted uh, his daughter you know he I would go visit and he would I, I'm, I guess this is the message the Lord wants me to speak about today um, drugs are so destructive they're designed to kill and destroy and that's exactly what it did to my son and his family it killed and destroyed and divided his family you know and so many of the uh, original family her mother said love God but there's so much strife and division I had a reason for doing what I did I'm a bold person if I am in the store and I see a stranger abusing a child I will I I'm bold enough to go up to the situation and 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 make the confrontation necessary to spare the child and redirect the parents thinking to get him out of that madnet mad mode rage you know not you know shake my fist at him and cuss him down but you're supposed to approach him peacefully and calmly and and say excuse me but uh you know just something to redirect their thinking and get their attention off of the anger of to towards the child and then you know go report them to the service desk and give them the identity and the police will be called and that someone will intervene on behalf of the child you know we we need to do these things but my son chose drugs and he liked them he told me that he says I like drugs mom I says well we got a problem then you know we got a problem and that is uh, I'm not gonna let my granddaughter live under those conditions because the conditions of their home due to the usage of drugs was disgusting unlivable unacceptable to me you know she was my granddaughter and she was other people's granddaughter as well but they didn't step up to the plate and do anything about it you know um, I was chosen because I heard a voice say go get that baby my God said go get that baby and it was during one of their dis terrible terrible outrageous outrage is disputes between the two of them and the baby was right under their feet you know it's kinda like two dogs fighting and you're trying to pull them apart and uh, it's 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 scary it's ch it's difficult and um, her mother called me and she had him put I said put him in jail and he she did and he served six month sentence for that incident and I said pack up a, a diaper bag for me I'm taking 
the baby and um, if you want to come see her you better clean yourself up and I mean no drugs no drinking and change your mouth no foul mouth you know and the reason I set those standards was because I come from that my mother was so abusive to us children and her mouth was the foulest mouth I ever heard no she there is no trucker out there that would beat her in the foul mouthness in her foul speech her vocabulary was disgusting and it, she would beat us down mentally you know we were worthless good for nothing rotten I don't know why I gave birth to you. I don't want you. I don't, you know, you're a pain in my blah, blah, blah. You know, when you're raised like that, you produce a stinking thinking. You think you, you believe that about yourself. Well, it's just not true. If you're out there and you've been told that, don't you believe that? That's not true. I believed it. And that's why I came to the place that I came to when I was in my 30s. And I just shook my fist at the Lord and said, if you're up there, I've heard about you. You better come down here and show yourself to me or I'm out of here. And this was prior to what my son had done. And so getting back to that, <clears throat> I took the baby and I told him, I said, you're, you can come see her anytime you want to, but these are the rules. You, life comes with rules, folks. And you know what? This is what the Bible is. The Bible gives us the rules, the precepts, the guidelines to live in a corrupt world full of violence, full of vulgarity, full of profanity, full of travesty, full of filth and garbage. And it teaches us to live righteously, right standing with God, in a very ugly, worldly, corrupt world. And the world is as corrupt as it is because this world is Satan's palace. He lives here. He's cast down to the earth to tempt mankind through their sinful nature because we're all born with a fallen estate. And we got to connect to the Creator to recognize our fallen estate so we can recognize that we're sinners. And so when we read the Word, we can tell the difference between how we should leave, live and how we've been living. And if we make the decision and make the choices to change the way we think, which will change our heart, which will change our behavior, which will change our environment because we'll become more productive and effective because we'll be more God conscious and not self conscious. Okay. The word is spiritual food for your soul. It lifts you up. It, t it tells you, it gives you faith. It gives you hope. tells you God loves you. The greatest of things is love. So in Corinthians, 1 Corinthians chapter 13, verse 4, this is God's love. God loves is patient. The word says that I do not come now and show the rage and wrath to mankind so that I show them that I am patiently waiting for everyone to come unto me. He's patient. Can you imagine the extension of his patience looking down on this world and knowing every incident, thought, memory, everything every human being, seven billion trillion people have done, think, said, and done, and it's been thousands and thousands of years, and, and he waits for all to come to him and recognize and reconceal to the Creator, we the creation. So His love is very, very patient. It's kind. Love is not jealous or boastful or proud or rude. I used to be the rudest person you ever met. 
and I'm ashamed of myself for being that way. But I've been, I've repented, and I'm not rude anymore. I'm politely bold, because I don't tolerate bad behavior in anybody, especially towards children. Okay. Love does not demand its own way. I know so many people in relationships the problems that they're having in the relationship is between the two of them. They're each demanding their own way. There's no room for error. We have to love each other in our relationships to leave room for error because we do fall short of the glory of God. It says so. We're sinners. We have a fallen estate. We tend to do things wrong sometimes. We make mistakes. It's stupid to do something that you made a mistake at and didn't learn from and you repeat it over and over and over and over again when it's wrong. That's stupid. But it's ignorance when you just do something and you get in trouble for it because it, it was wrong. You've made a mistake, but you never do it again. is a mistake. It's okay. you got to leave room for error. That's that's how I raise my granddaughter, you know. She just hates it when she makes a mistake. And I said, "Honey, give you cut yourself a little slack. You're a human being. You've made a mistake, and now you're going to have a consequence. That's my job as a parent. But don't do it again." Oh, and she doesn't. She doesn't. If she's done something and she's learned that it's the wrong thing to do, it's unacceptable. And I base it off of Scripture because Scripture is based on what's right, righteous, just, and fair. Now, if we all were to base our decisions, <clears throat> our actions, our behaviors, how we treat one another on righteousness, justice, and fairness, we wouldn't have the disputes and the strife and the division that we have in the world today against one another. We would love each other. Okay? Love is not irritable. How many times a day are you irritated? By the person sitting behind you, by the person sitting next to you at your job, by the person that's in front of you, or the person that's across from you that you see, you know, you look up and they're looking at you. And, and how many times do you find yourself irritated? Can you imagine our God? And he sees the world in the state that it is today, but he's not irritated. That's a holy God. I can't say myself. I'd, I'd, I'd snuff us out of here. You know, because the world is not going to get better. It's not going to get better. It's going to get worse. Because Jesus, is, the word says, when, I, when he left here and was resurrected and ascended into heaven, he said, I leave you with peace. But it says, when I come again, I come with the sword. And the blood will run deep in the streets of my city, Jerusalem. That's his chosen city. Country. God help us. God help us. I can't imagine. <clears throat> and it keeps no record of wrong when it has been wronged. How many times have you thrown it in their face? You did this. You did that. I used to do all of this stuff, folks. I used, I used to be the epitome of the opposite of this to my husband that I took care of until he died at 82. He died of leukemia. I mean, we fought like cats and dogs when we first got together for years. For years. It wasn't until um, we were like... 20 some years in our relationship and our and my son was um probably 16 years old before I started the the word of the God, of God and my my boot camp for the Lord and I being obedient to the word of God changing me changing me every day every day every day that uh it, my environment around me started to change you know it took that long that long. It don't happen overnight. And I think that's why a lot of people won't pick up the word. Just like a teenager said to me one time when I said, what's wrong with being born again? She says, I don't want to follow the rules. 
Well, the, the book, the Bible is commandments. They're precepts. They're rules. They're, they're, they're the way, the navigator to living a righteous life, which is the way God predestined, wanted mankind to live. But the one thing he gave the mankind through Adam and Eve was a, in our soul a willingness. A willingness to do what we want. When we want it. What I think, what I want, what I feel. That's what the soul consists of. The sinful nature. And they weren't willing to follow the rules. Kind of like Moses. He said, speak to the rock. Moses was fed up and irritated with the people, so he struck the rock. And because of that little disobedience, Moses helped two million people out of the bondage going around the mountain and around the mountain and around the mountain in the wilderness, but was told then by God, you will not see the promised land, Moses. You will not enter into the promised land. You will die without seeing it through your disobedience irritability is not a good thing and I and I see in this paragraph verse 4 through 7 it's just the whole concept of how we should live and treat one another okay it is ne it is never glad about injustice but rejoices whenever the truth wins out Love never gives up, love never loses faith, is always hopeful, and endures through every circumstance. The Bible says that through, while you're going through your trials and your tribulations, patiently endure. There's that patience in this paragraph and endurance. But you've got to do it through the power of, that is in this verse. When you apply this verse in your living everyday life under every situation and circumstance with everybody that's involved in your life, you've tapped into the power of this scripture. That power releases God's love, God's grace. He reconciles the family, unifies the family. You have peace, you have harmony, you have joy, and you and you just you, the, your whole environment changes, and it's worth it. Why doesn't people? Why do people not want that? Well, I can give you a, that answer because I was there. I didn't want it because of the same reason that teenager. I I did not realize that it wasn't about following rules. You know, life is about learning, not about living. You were born and you're going to die. You're going to live a span of life. God determines the day that you die. Whatever age it may be that he takes you. I have found scripture. I've got to find it. It says I take those young early because I know that if they were to stay on the earth, they would not withstand their suffering. That helped my daughter now, because I adopted my granddaughter. And I adopted her because when you have children, when you have a child, you are their parent. You have legal rights. And nobody can... Nobody can come in and, and usurp your right as a parent. So in order to get parental right to take proper care of her, because every time I, she got sick, I had to go find them and get their permission for the doctors to treat her. And when I found them, they were laying in their puke from being drunk and high and filth. And I just wouldn't tolerate it. I wouldn't tell. I said, there'll be no more. This is it. I will not ever come and look for you again. And I went and got a lawyer. And I took her away from them. I wish more grandparents would do that. But there's this link. You know, oh, that's my son. Oh, that's my daughter. Yeah, he's my son and I love him. But I will not stand for anything he does that is wrong and unjust. 
if he's wrong, he's going to suffer the consequences for it. And I do the same thing with her. I love him. But when you do wrong and you repeat that over and over and over and over and you don't make any changes to better your life, I'm not going to condone that. I will not do it. And I expect that for anything. If I'm in a bad behavior in any way, I look for correction. Correct me. Leave me a message. Gladys, you are out of line. You should have never said this. You should have never. Let me know. Correction is good. The word says in Psalms, those that receive rebuke are wise. Rebuke in the Hebrew means correction. You, I, you know, correct me. Like and share my page. Subscribe to my channel. Share on Facebook. Get it out there. If you know of somebody that can hear the, a message like this and needs to be encouraged, to, needs to be led out of the bondage of whatever they're in, you know, I've been through it all. I've been through it. I've been beaten, battered, bruised, broken. And I, and I am who I am today because of my God. Because of the Lord Jesus Christ. And I thank him for it every day. I am grateful for the breath he gives me when I wake up in the morning. You know. And I thank him for my daughter. She's a blessing to me. She's a pure, they don't know what they threw away. They threw her away. As many, you know, that's why drugs and alcohol is so bad. That's okay to have a drink. The Bible even says so. Jesus never drank water. He drank nothing but wine. He says it's okay to have a glass of wine a day. That It helps this, whatever uh, ails your stomach. It's okay. But do not become a drunkard. Why? Well, I can remember my day when I used to drink and I got stone drunk. What did I do? I acted like a fool. And I never did it again. To control myself, I would take my straws and I'd count them. And, it, and once I got to that number that I disciplined myself at that made me still coherent and, log and logical and I was able to get home without hurting myself or anybody else, I stopped. I operated in self-control. But my, a lot of people who drink and do drugs, they lose that. They don't have the ability. They can't do it no more. And that's what it's designed to do. It's designed to kill and destroy. Satan loves people who love drinks and getting drunk and smoking and dope and getting high. He loves it when they do that. You know, he has stolen you from God. He's got another one of God's people. You can't be born again and be doing that stuff because if you are, there's a scripture that says when you knock on that door and you say, Lord, let me in, I have prayed to you. I have given, taken communion for you. I have, you know, uh, believed in you. I have faith in you. The Lord's going to say, go away. I do not know you. Why? You can't just get born again and then go by and live whatever life you're living just because that you want your own way. You got to the, salvation will change you. It will change your heart which will change your behavior, which will change your environment. We all need God. And I say that boldly to anyone willing to listen. And we don't need religion. We don't need a denomination. A matter of fact, in the scripture, in the gospels, one of the apostles asked what is religion, Jesus? And he says, religion is taking care of the widows, the orphans, and the poor. That's religion. So, you know, you're worrying about being a denominate. I'm a non-denominating, God-fearing, true believer. That's what I call myself. I believe in God the Father, Jesus Christ the Son, and His Holy Spirit lives in me. And I am now an imitator of my God. And I try to reflect that in my life. I try to take and show this through these videos in hopes to help people that are struggling recognize we all need God. 
and he's patiently waiting for you when he calls your name every day every day before I got saved he called my name and I ignored it because I was all I was so full of myself and it says he knows people's everybody's heart he will blind the eye plug the ear and veil the heart so you cannot hear his voice because he knows you won't change like my son he talks Jesus now that he's in a six by six but he didn't live for Jesus when he was out on the streets he's talking a good talk but he couldn't walk the walk take sacrifice that's the principle behind the sacrifice and the crucifixion sacrificing the flesh what I want what I think what I feel so folks being born again is a good thing you do need God and if you haven't connected with the Creator get on the phone landline to the throne talk to God accept him as your Lord and Savior tell him you believe in him ask him to give you faith and courage repent of your sins and take it from there every day talk to him every day and you will change and your environment will change I guarantee it God bless you and you have a great day